So welcome to the State of the Cloud South Africa 2020. My name is Kevin Durman. I'm the CEO of Cascade.Cloud. Uh, with me is Russell Warren, who's our CTO. So hello, Russell. Hey, hello, Kevin, and hello to everybody. Uh, really looking forward to this one. We know it's 12 o'clock because if you can hear some bells ringing, it is a nearby uh, church, which is ringing the bells at 12 o'clock. So we're right on time. Okay, well, it's good to uh, good to have a, a clock that we, we're going by. So today we're going to be uh, discussing the state of the cloud uh, in South Africa. We're going to be sharing with you some research from the Flexera State of the Cloud uh, global report that comes out every year around about this time. Um, but before we get stuck in, I want to just remind you of some of the, the benefits of, um, I guess it's X as a service. So it's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, SaaS as a service, software as a service, all of the, uh, the above. And on the basic level, one of the, the key fundamentals is the the performance that it is elastic that it is scalable that cloud is certainly better than having a, a server in your office or servers in your office and the reason being is that obviously it can grow and expand and contract to whatever your requirements are at that particular time um, it can scale up in terms of uh, getting a bigger server and it can scale out in terms of adding on additional servers to your cloud infrastructure. Cloud is also always on, um, very, very stable. Um, you have quick recovery. You can design your architecture for live failover. And of course, you're also dealing with economies of scale and therefore the cost is quite important as well. And you're paying only for what you are needing and what you're using um, at that current uh, time as well. So, um, but those are the, the basic costs. And uh, not so the basic costs, the basic benefits of it. The more exciting stuff and the stuff that we at Cascade really like and where we consider to be the real benefits of cloud is this ability to unlock innovation and really to increase your competitive advantage in your business. You can get stuff instantly. You can try new projects, fail fast, and hopefully succeed um, at them as well. And of course, there's no capital intensive uh, process to go through. It's not like you've got to go and lay out uh, 2 million Rand to start a new project or to try a new project. You can really literally spin these up in a matter of minutes, test the project, test some new development. And if it doesn't work and it doesn't get customer adoption, then you can spin it down. So you can really unlock that value in it. And that is what we consider true business agility, the ability to respond rapidly to market demands, the ability to disrupt and giving you the choice on how you want your business to go. So before we get into the research, I just want to share with you something called the prisoner's dilemma. So I want to introduce you to Mr. A and Mr. B. And Mr. A and Mr. B have not been good citizens of society. They decided to rob a bank and they went in one night, robbed this bank, and uh, they weren't too good at, it, good at it. The police kind of have an idea of who did it. And so what they did was they arrested Mr. A and Mr. B, and they're now holding them in two separate cells. And they've gone to Mr. A and Mr. B and said, right, individually, uh, of course, they can't see each other. You've got a, a, a three options. Number one, you confess to the robbery. And if you both confess, you will get five years. Uh, if they, they could remain silent, that's a choice of theirs, but they could also accuse the other person, remembering that they're in these separate holding rooms. If the one says, it wasn't me, it was uh, Mr. B, well then Mr. A goes scot-free, gets zero years, and Mr. B will get 20 years in prison. Uh, if the opposite happens, that uh, Mr. B says it was Mr. A, well, Mr. A gets 20 years and Mr. B goes scot-free. If they both say it was us, five years, and if nobody speaks, one year. So you've got to think, okay, well, what would you do in this particular situation? And the majority of people, um, obviously, I'm putting moral uh, judgments aside for this, but the majority of people act in their own best interest and figure out, well, you know, I'm going to blame the other person. And of course, once they do that, they both get five years and they both lose out or they should both keep quiet. Now, the situation with cloud is you're actually in a bit of a reverse prisoner's dilemma. We've got lots of companies out there figuring, should we move to cloud? Should I move to cloud now um, or later? They've got to 
go through this decision process. And here it is just depicted in terms of this um, prisoner's dilemma, but with the cloud aspect. And I call it the business dilemma. And this is what most companies are in. So if you choose, well, no cloud, we're not moving to the cloud. Then, and company A and company B decide we're not moving to the cloud. You're gonna be in that first scenario over here where you will both be crying <laughs> uh, eventually because you will not have the agility that other companies have. If cloud B decides that uh, they're gonna go cloud and cloud A doesn't choose, well, cloud B is gonna have a, the reverse image of what you're seeing there. Cloud B is going to be smiling and be very happy because they went cloud and cloud A actually will be locked away in the ways of the past. And now if all companies go cloud, then you kind of have that scenario where we're sitting in the bottom right-hand quadrant where customers and clients are operating in an equal environment of agility and of that. Now you can see from this that actually, the moment some companies have moved to cloud, you have no choice but to go there. Otherwise you will be locked behind bars and not have that freedom to move your company. So. We're going to go through some of this research um, first and I'll, I hope you start to understand why you want to move to cloud uh, to get that business agility and that competitive uh, view of the market. So the Flexera state of the cloud. Um, Russ, did you have a comment there? Uh, through coming at all? Well, I, w I was going to say that um, for uh, those listening and wondering, that's you know interesting this business dilemma is an interesting thing you're obviously thinking about cloud um, otherwise you wouldn't be joining us on this on this webinar um, and I, I can say that uh, I don't think there's any option really uh, I, it, this is an inevitable um, uh, move to cloud that will happen across the board it's really a question of uh, when and and how fast are you going to do it as a company um, but just anecdotally uh, when I started working with with AWS, um, I really saw the potential of the per pervasiveness of cloud, and and for me it was uh, it was quite clear. Uh, having seen technologies kind of rise and fall over the last twenty odd year years, I won't say twenty how many to give too much away, um, but uh, it was it's clear that this was going to win. And at that time, Amazon's share price was uh, I think about six hundred dollars a share, um, and I thought to myself, I really should buy these shares. But then I also said, you're not a an investor, so I didn't. I'm still kicking myself that $2,400 a share today, um, and much of that growth is uh, is driven um, besides the Amazon business on the e-commerce side uh, more recently because of of um, uh, you know our increasing reliance on that in, in light of um, you know global the global pandemic, um, but certainly a lot of it has been driven by the growth and the future potential of of AWS. So um, for me, there's no dilemma. Yeah, uh, and I hope that uh, more and more businesses start to see that, that there isn't really a dilemma with it. Um, and yet people are still umming and eyeing, and uh, a lot of them trying to sweat the assets. So the Flexera 2020 State of the Cloud Report is a global report. Um, I've given you an indication here of uh, the kind of industries that they've surveyed and the kind of companies that they've surveyed as, as well. So on the right-hand side, the respondents, it's a mix of both enterprise and uh, SMB companies, although SMB is really um, medium-sized companies representing 26% of the report. But some of the data that we'll go through, we actually break it down into the SMB view versus the enterprise view. And 48% uh, of those uh, people that were um, surveyed uh, come from more than companies that are more than 5,000 employees. So as you can see, these are rather large global companies that are out there and across all sectors um, as well. Then in terms of geographic representation, as you can see, um, it is a global they called it a global uh, report. However, it is North American centric. So you need to keep that in mind with 64% coming from the Americas, which includes Canada, uh, South America, North America, Europe being 20%, uh, Asia Pacific 14. And there we fall into the rest of the world at a lovely little 2% that is uh, stuck away over there. So this is why we felt that we needed to actually give you a view of what's happening globally and contrast that to what's happening in South Africa. So we can really get a good perspective of what we need to do in our current environment. And it also is a great opportunity to gaze into a crystal ball because we typically tend to be 12 to 18 months behind the curve. 
So, workloads uh, in public cloud. This is the first thing that uh, that we're going to look at. If we look at the enterprise and the SMB uh, respondents from that. The first thing that we can see is um, that the amount, when we say the number of enterprise companies that have workloads in public cloud, uh, you've got 48% plus another 9% that are moving additional workloads in, in 12 months uh, time. So really a, a large majority there that is in public cloud. But what's really surprising about the 2020 report is the amount of SMB that has moved to cloud because it used to be that there was enterprise had great percentage of enterprise customers had for cloud workloads. But as you can see, there's like 70% of SMB respondents had workloads uh, in cloud. Russ, uh, what, do you, what do you think about make from that? Um, it's very interesting to see those growth patterns. I think to a large extent, um, it may be that there is a little bit of of uh, sort of skewing in the data uh, due to the the, the um, North American and European, uh, the weight of that data, I should say, in, uh, within these results. Um, and so to a large extent, enterprise cloud usage in those markets, uh, which are considered either m uh, you know advanced or mature or uh, kind of intermediate, um, relatively speaking, we can see how more um, SMB workload growth would be reflected in those figures. Um, not to say that enterprise is completely slowing down, um, but we, you know, we're talking about an absolute, uh, you know, have you got workloads in yes or no, not not sort of how much and, and so on. So um, that's part of it. Um, and then the next part of it is really just mm -hmm. how much um, cloud is becoming a mainstream technology, uh, no matter where you are. So although we are a little behind the curve, um, you know, we'll talk about this a bit later, but you've seen an, an AWS data center land in the country. Um, and it's a significant investment in South Africa and a, and a really, I think uh, people don't realize just what a difference it's going to make um, once everyone catches on to, to what that gives them. Um, and uh, obviously Microsoft being here already. So you've got this technology available and, and quite mainstream. Yeah. Um, the, the next one is the enterprise cloud strategy and gives us a, a great view and there, there really is a big change um, year on year over here as well. So you can see that 93% of enterprises are using a multi-cloud strategy. And in that multi-cloud strategy, they've got a mixture of hybrid cloud. So it could be on-premise public cloud, it could be private cloud and public cloud um, and using multiple public clouds. So there's, uh, there was a, a large growth in that from year on year with that. Um, not unexpected from an enterprise point of view. And if you wanted to see what it looked like in 2019 last year, you can see the multi-cloud was at 84% um, and there was also multiple private uh, clouds that they were using if you looked at the, the strategy on the, on the right. So that's gone up to 93% and uh, the multiple private clouds has dropped away uh, completely from use. So you can see a definite progression in the maturity of enterprises um, utilizing that. Now, what are they doing um, with it when they're using multi-cloud? Um, I think it's very good to actually say, well, why? Why are they using multi-cloud? And I know, Russ, that you had a couple um, points of views on this that you'd like to go into. Absolutely. I think um, uh, there's, there's quite a, a clear distinction with enterprise um, versus SMB type companies. Um, enterprises are governed by um, a almost a different set of rules. So, you know, when looking at the multi-cloud approach, firstly, you've got to just consider that enterprises do have things like risk and governance portfolio committees or, um, you know, a lot more involvements in, uh, in things like internal audits on the on the operations of the business. Uh, and so risk mitigation is, a, is an important thing and that often pushes people to saying, I need my workloads to be portable and we will have multiple clouds and so on. And there's, you know, there's different departments, different decision makers, some degree of autonomy around budgets. Uh, and so you, you get a mix coming in from those sort of things. But, you know, around things like multi-cloud, architectures uh, there's there's a lot of other things going on inside here um, so uh, you, you often you'll have tightly coupled applications um, and when I say tightly coupled I don't mean just the application itself as in the database and the application and maybe the, the sort of front end or a web tier or something like that but also that um, if for example you run within the Oracle 
um, ecosystem, that ecosystem works very tightly together and it's and there's quite a lot of inertia to try and move out of that. Um, so you will, that will also drive um, some of that multi-cloud um, architectural requirement for use. Um, and there's a, you know, that's just one example of, of um, a number of different uh, use cases where those where those rules apply. And that does trickle down to some extent within to the to the SMB um, as well. Um, I think you'll see uh, over over time that uh, as a general acceptance of, of cloud grows um, and really as it moves into into a space where you're not really going to consider other options. Um, people will look very carefully at their multi-cloud uh, strategies as well. Um, not to say that they will that they will change in terms of percentages, but I think they might uh, look at the, um, the the workload type uh, very carefully and the benefits around mm. um, using particular cloud infrastructures. And we'll see that in some of the figures as to what some of the challenges are that the more mature companies are facing versus the starters. Yeah, and of course, if you go multi-cloud, uh, it really means in a lot of the time that you have to have uh, multiple teams. So you'd have to have, for example, an AWS team and a, a Google Cloud team and an Azure team if you wanted to be in all of them. Um, so while there is some similarity in the services, if you really want to get deeply involved in the architecture, you really need to be um, quite a specialist in that particular area. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so th I think that's one of the reasons why we don't see a, a lot of SMBs going for this multi-cloud architecture, um, just from that that as aspect of it, it's just becomes far too onerous to manage all of those uh, different um, areas as well. Right, this is one of my favorite slides. It's the annual pu public cloud spend. Um, <laughs> and obviously, being the business that we're in, um, we like to see people spending money in the cloud. Um, it's really a, a, a good sign. <laughs> but what really struck me about this was the amount um, that they're seeing over here. So this is uh, annual cloud spend. And if you saw this, 16% of companies that were surveyed that are spending more than $12 million annually um, each uh, on on cloud. Um, while th there you go on the 24% that's really in the SMB side, that's up to 600K, $600,000 a year. So, you know, you can look at that at, uh, at roughly uh, 1.2 million Rand a year. Um, no, what am I talking about? 12 million Rand a year that they, they're spending over there, that's potentially. So, uh, your view on that? Um, I think we'd be surprised when we see, um, uh, if we take just infrastructure as a service, because that's often how we look at public cloud spend, uh, we we would say, wow, you know, that seems, seems to be a lot of money to be spending on uh, infrastructure. But having said that, um, I, I know of many companies in South Africa that are within that, um, you know, certainly spending $600,000 a year um, and more uh, in many cases, and that's growing, um, particularly in the, in the enterprise space. Um, uh, relatively small, I guess, for some people's some people's budgets uh, in their IT spend, but also, you know, when you start to take into account that you've got SaaS offerings and you've got uh, things like Office 365, all these different things running, uh, then these numbers um, they're still very high. There's still there's a lot of a lot of growth for South African companies in terms of how much they spend on cloud, um, uh, but th they're not completely scary when you when you really boil it down. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, so. What are the challenges that these companies are experiencing? Um, great to uh, to see some of these, and we really understand a lot of these because we see some of the companies in South Africa having uh, similar kinds of, of challenges. So one of the top ones here is understanding the application dependencies, um, ass assessing the technical feasibility of moving to the, the cloud, assessing on-prem versus cloud costs, right-sizing, selecting the best instances, and migrating apps and data, et cetera. Now, where we, we come in as, uh, as Cascade on this is really solving a lot of those problems for, for companies. So we would go through the consulting exercise of looking at what are their applications that they have on premise, what are the dependencies between that, and really integrating those applications. So you could have some applications that you are keeping on premise and some that you're moving to the cloud and you would need an integration between those two. Not all applications are uh, suited for the cloud and therefore it is necessary to go through these technical feasibility studies on moving it and you need to assess the the costs between the two. Russell, I know we spoke some time ago about um, 
companies feeling, oh, well, cloud is, is just cheaper and it's only about the, the, the cost. So when companies um, are assessing on-prem versus cloud costs, what kind of exercise do you feel they should go through? Um, two types. Uh, first, get yourself a high-level uh, overview. A lot of that uh, depends on things like um, total cost of ownership. Um, depending on the kind of company that you are, that may be um, a fairly um, uh, you know, a number with, uh, with a, a large, a reasonable amount of variation and, you know, you, you can't get too exact on it. Um, or you might want to dig a little bit deeper, but it, it can, it, it can uh, get reasonably accurate. That's a high level overview. And then uh, you need to look in depth and it, it's, it's not just for the mi migration. So your exercise is quite detailed. I know we don't have it up here on the slides, but, uh, you know, we could give examples of some project templates and plans, which will show the kind of depth and detail that you want to go into and doing things like understanding app dependencies and so on. But it's very important also to inform your um, architectures and how you deploy cloud in the future, because that also has a knock-on effect on costs. So we'll see that come up in some of the, in some of the other um, challenges that uh, companies face is, uh, you know, how do they get cost management and control? And we've seen time and time again, it's, it's often that they're having to take uh, an architecture that they've built because they didn't do the work up front. Uh, they built something, they did something, and now they're breaking it down because it was done wrong or it was the wrong technology uh, or it was beyond their needs or, or whatever the case may be. So very important to, to dig through these and to, uh, as you say, partners are important in this because they have the experience and often have the tools. And I think those last two points that are, you see on the graph over there, uh, selecting the right cloud provider and managing the app post-migration are two elements that people don't give enough consideration to. Um, so once you've migrated to the cloud, it's not only about getting it there, but actually managing the application uh, as well is critically important. And that's where a cloud managed service provider can add a lot of value to it. And that takes us through to the next cloud, which is actually something new that came up in the Flexera State of the Cloud report this year. They suddenly had um, people saying, well, we, we're using cloud managed service providers and this is an area that is um, growing. As you can see over there, 26% um, of respondents says, uh, are used for most, uh, MSPs are used for most of their public cloud usage. 21% are used for some public cloud usage and 13% plan um, to, to use. So that's the majority of the respondents that are utilizing uh, managed service providers as well. Top cloud initiatives for 2020, what are these companies really wanting to do uh, this year? So no surprise, um, everybody's under cost pressure, uh, but they want to optimize the existing use of cloud. So that really leads to this question of cost savings and how to implement cost savings. Once you move to the cloud, because it is so easy to spin things up, it's quite easy for things to get out of control. Uh, Russell, why don't you give us some examples of, of things that can uh, go wrong and, and get your costs out of control. Absolutely. I was actually just thinking now that there's uh, there's probably 10 things that you can look at um, that we should be calling the greatest hits uh, of cost savings because, uh, you know, when you go through all of those things, you'll, you'll find um, some, you know, probably 20% cost savings in your, in your bill uh, just off the bat. So, uh, you know, things like right sizing, um, EC2 instances, uh, and that goes not just across uh, EC2, but across other resources, uh, making sure that there's not unused resources, um, taking advantage of vendor discount programs, which a lot of people are unaware of, um, and if you are taking advantage of them to make sure that you, that you choose the right ones. Um, and then, you know, there's a number of other things, and that's really just starting without making any changes to your infrastructure you know, or, or, your, or your applications. Uh, later on, you can look to move more towards sort of cloud native, uh, which takes advantage of, of um, uh, infrastructure, which is a lot more uh, flexible. So more this loosely coupled uh, idea in cloud native, and that allows you just to, to um, keep your costs down in, in other ways too. So um, I could provide you the, the whole list, but it would probably bore a few. <laughs> and it would probably be another another webinar. <laughs> another, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> yeah. One of the ones that I found particularly interesting here was move on-prem software uh, to to SaaS, and um, we have uh, the, the the six, and we we have seven of them. The seven R's of cloud mig migration: that's re replatform, repurposing, um, etc. And one one of them is 
really about retiring what you uh, are, are using and actually moving it to a SaaS solution. And that seems to be quite a popular way of doing things where people want to get away from managing um, a lot of the infrastructure that's under, underlying their systems and they can move to, if they can move to the SaaS solution, it makes quite a lot of sense to do that. And you can see that 43% of respondents over there are about moving on-prem software to a SaaS uh, type environment where they don't have to worry about any of those uh, aspects. Um, you can also see over here on the third highest one is expanding the use of containers and we're going to have a bit of a discussion around that later on when we take on the, the South African perspective. But So just bear in mind over here uh, from the global view that in the top three is expanding use of uh, containers and having a cloud first strategy coming in at number four over there. Year on year, um, what's changed between 2019 and 2020? Um, again, something nice to have a look at. If you look at the, the, the top one in terms of cost savings, it went from 64 almost up by 10% uh, to 73%. Um, so that was quite a big uh, jump over there. Uh, again, big growth in the use of containers. So you can see that really steadily increasing. And the other big jumps uh, over there, certainly governance and reporting, but you can see what I was mentioning on the SAS, it went from 29% of companies last year that responded to a 43% that are um, now wanting to actually utilize a SAS service as well. How one should measure your cloud progress and if you're doing a, a good job. Uh, Russell, if you'd like to speak to this, this slide. Absolutely. I think um, it, it might not tell you if you're doing a good job entirely um, uh, because in, in, as we mentioned right in the beginning, uh, your your cloud progress is not always related to uh, the old, uh, I guess, technical debt side of things. Um, you know, I spend as little as, a, little as I can uh, on my IT, but um, uh, rather on how it's actually, you know, as you see further down in this list, how it's actually uh, building a value in that. So but a lot of a lot of people will will say, um, you, you know, IT and IT costs and technology costs are, are a line item on an income statement. And uh, when that income statement gets to boards or when it gets some sort of oversight, uh, people want to keep that as low as possible. No one really wants to spend money on IT, which is understandable. Um, uh, so, which, and again, again it, it, it speaks to the importance of um, having your cloud strategy uh, well defined. You know, are you looking to to create competitive edge, or are you looking to just save costs? You can do both, um, but uh, essentially, your real value starts to come out in, in the competitive side of things. And certainly, in terms of the uh, speed of delivery and products and services, value delivered to business units, this is where we're seeing real advantage coming up. Uh, even the speed of innovation. And, and cloud opens this up to an, um, uh, many different types of, of companies. You're talking about the speed of innovation, uh, I'll, I'll give you a super simple example uh, of that is, is how someone, um, uh, one of the companies that we're working with is, is really making custom fitted furniture, I guess, for spaces, you know, storage boxes and that sort of thing. And uh, that's an easy thing. That's a, that's a factory putting things together and, and the website and, you know, how can technology help that business? Well, uh, there's a fair, uh, um, very accessible technology that will allow you to use um, um, AR to assess the size of a space so that you could use your phone to take a picture of the space, get an idea of your dimensions that are required uh, and use that as part of your, your planning and, and ordering uh, online. So, you know, that's an easy way to, to generate um, competitive edge. So uh, overall, um, we can see what the what the focus is, uh, still on cost and, and efficiency savings, but um, uh, some of, of the benefits uh, creeping up that scale uh, a lot more nowadays. Great, and um, obviously over there, what they, they're putting a metric over there is customer adoption of cloud offerings as well. So there they're referring to applications where the customer is actually utilizing that uh, cloud offering. So if you think about things like uh, banking applications, et cetera, that's that particular ex example that's come through. In terms of maturity, there's three levels that they 
classify the cloud um, users in. There's a beginner, an intermediate, and an advanced uh, level. And not surprisingly, um, in terms of their challenges, they, they differ, but there is some similarity on it. But the, so the beginners will have a lack of resources and expertise. That's at 90%. Intermediate, that drops down. And really, the guys who are advanced in it, that goes down to, to number five. Um, while cloud spend tends to go up in the opposite direction. And that's really typical in what we see uh, companies. Companies, um, we have a, a cloud cost optimization practice and often we we go to companies who have started we, we might have done a migration for them we've done a piece of cloud work and we say to them we would like to manage your cloud cost optimization and ensure that your environment is always optimized and they say well no we don't need that you know we know what our costs are <laughs> it's fine uh, six months later uh, they typically come back to us and say uh, we remember you said you could help us with uh, keeping these costs under control and really that speaks to again as i mentioned it's so easy for things to get out of control because you can do it you can spin up systems you can uh, decide okay well we're we're expecting um, a rush on our e-commerce platform so we want to get a bigger system but we don't want to do scalability so we're just going to move it onto a bigger server people spin things up leave them lying around etc so a lot of that is involved in that security has come up again um, as one of the big points uh, number two in beginner number one in intermediate number two in um, advanced users and begs the old question of is cloud secure that uh, that often comes up as a, a beginner's question worrying about the security of cloud and in those environments where uh, cloud usage is for cloud advanced it's not really about asking that question of is cloud secure anymore but really asking the question of how do you secure your applications how do you secure your environment and when we architect things we make sure that we're architecting for security straight away and there's no doubt that in terms of the infrastructure itself that public cloud infrastructure is more secure than um, on-premise uh, that is a, is a, a definite it, it, and it can certainly give companies access to uh, security technologies that wouldn't normally be available to them, uh, which is also very important. So, um, you know, we can discuss uh, security architectures quite a lot um, uh, and, you know, secured by design, as you mentioned, but a lot of the technologies that you're able to access within cloud, uh, you, would, you might uh, find um, prohibitive from a cost point of view. Um, or you might uh, lack the um, internal skill and experience and have to re rely on someone who charges a great deal of money to manage that security technology for you. It's not the case in, in uh, public cloud. It's very important for people to remember that um, as they go out and, and build their cloud infrastructures. Yep. So when we look at the organizational spend on public cloud and we say, well, what are the companies planning to do over the next 12 months? Uh, if you look at their current spend in that blue section and that green section over there is that they're expecting 47% growth um, in their cloud spend over the next 12 months. If the bottom uh, bar that you're seeing over there has really indicating why there's so much concern about the uh, the cost in uh, in cloud and their cost optimization because they've overshooting their original buzz budget by uh, approximately 23 percent that's what the report shows on this so um, again really highlighting why one needs to um, bring that cost optimization element into your cloud plans as well common question that we get asked um, which is the best cloud? AWS, Azure, Google, what should I move to and and why? <laughs> so um, we have our views on it. Uh, you know, we, we really like AWS um, and we've chosen them as our cloud provider of uh, public cloud provider of, of choice for which we design our architecture. Um, this is what this global report is showing over there. So 76% of uh, respondents were um, utilizing AWS, experimenting for the 12% and 5% planning to use. Uh, next is uh, Azure and next is Google Cloud. So certainly a vast majority using those top three hyperscalers um, over there. And then you can see the rest of uh, the data. How has this changed year on year? I think that's an important uh, question um, to look at. Um, and here you, you see those 
uh, graphs as well. So AWS uh, went from 61% uh, of respondents using it in 2019 um, to 76% in uh, 2020 and Azure also um, had a, a large amount of growth over there 52 percent to 63 percent Google Cloud from 19 to 35 so quite a lot of growth uh, as well you've got to add on to these numbers as well the VMware Cloud and AWS so again those are people using AWS infrastructure and running their VMware Lua loads on that so that top curve of AWS go and lump on the VMware Cloud on AWS on top of that and you can see it's a really large uh, percentage that is using uh, that. Any comments for us on that? Yeah, I always liken this um, uh, to the Tour de France or to any cycling race where you have a, a couple of uh, guys who've broken ahead of the rest of the peloton. Um, uh, and in many cases, they're sort of hauled in later uh, by the chasing pack. You know, so you've got two, three guys who've gone out to win the stage and they went too early. Uh, but in this case, it's clear to me that uh, both Amazon and Azure um, are, are in a race for that finish line. Um, it almost doesn't matter who finishes, they'll finish next to next to each other. Um, as you say, we have our personal choices in, uh, in terms of, of uh, which um, technology provider we prefer. Um, Google Clouds, uh, you know, I think is, is probably going to stay in that in that position. And uh, this is just my personal opinion. Um, uh, and, and then the rest, uh, I think, will we'll really battle to, to catch up. They'll end up with some market share. They're never going to be leading infrastructure providers or infrastructure as a service providers. Um, they certainly might lead in specific application spaces or in certain software as a service spaces, but um, uh, they're, they're part of the bunch, but they're, they're not the winners in terms of overall adoption yeah. and won't be, won't be foreseen. Yeah, we've, foreseen we've seen future. a large contract a large contraction in the space over the years. So if you look at the um, Gartner's Magic Quadrant for Infrastructure as a Service, uh, and you, we've got a, a great slide that takes you from 2013 right through to uh, 2020, and you can see the amount of players has just decreased in size um, in this uh, area. Good indication of, uh, of contraction. So um, in terms of SMB, um, and what the SMBs are, are grabbing, we've even seen a, a greater increase there on the AWS side. So AWS and the SMB market went from 53% of respondents to 74%, um, really showing a, a great increase over there. Azure, only a 5% uh, increase, also a large increase in Google Cloud um, respondents there on in the SMB side. And don't forget, add on that, uh, that VMware side as well. What are the top growing um, cloud services? And I'm showing you this slide because I want to contrast it again to what uh, people are utilizing in South Africa. But at number one um, globally is uh, IoT, so the Internet of, of Things. Second is container as a, uh, a service, um, machine learning. Uh, as well and artificial intelligence has seen a good increase data warehousing and serverless and um, I'm just going to not make too many comments about this I just want you to keep it in the back of your mind so that when we uh, chat about the South African perspective later you remember what were the top growing uh, services over there so how are we doing in South Africa well there is no doubt that cloud is dramatically cloud usage is dramatically uh, growing. Last year, we saw uh, public statements micro, uh, by Starry Standard Bank and Time Bank um, saying that they are embracing Amazon Web Services. Time Bank is uh, all in about 85% of their banking applications. Uh, their banking infrastructure is on AWS. Uh, Standard Bank got the green light to go ahead. So plenty headlines that are out there about um, cloud in South Africa. What is different though is how we are actually utilizing cloud. Now my broadband did a study um, last year where they um, surveyed 386 IT decision makers across small, medium and large companies and they got a response back saying 70% are utilizing any cloud services. Bear in mind that uh, when I say cloud we are including um, software as a service applications there, things like Office 365 uh, as well. So what cloud services are they using? Well you can see over here the majority um, have said that they are utilizing backups as a service, 
uh, software as a service and only 26%, 26.76% uh, 26 to be precise, said infrastructure as a service. And this is vastly different to what we're seeing globally. Most of those respondents that we've uh, analyzed on the Flexera report um, said that they were utilizing infrastructure and platform as a service. And here we really are using the basic services, the backup, the SaaS stuff. Russ, why do you think this is so? Um, I think it's it's largely um, due to uh, sort of the solution side. So what has been pushed as a as a solution to whatever the particular pain point is. So yes, you need to do backup. Um, why keep all that stuff on premise? Um, uh, rather have it in the cloud. And in these particular cases, when we refer to cloud, uh, or at least when the server refers to cloud, it's it's referring to, um, I guess self-titled cloud providers, if I, if I can say that. So, uh, whereas when we're looking at cloud, we really look at the, the hyperscale guys like Amazon and Microsoft, Google, and so on. So people backing up to the cloud, uh, straightforward, probably driven by your, your application uh, or your service provider, um, and to some extent through costs, software as a services, um, that 40% number is, is actually uh, in line with the international uh, numbers from an adoption point of view. Um, and infrastructure as a service, uh, very similar um, uh, kind of picture. You know, is my stuff going to be, is Terraco considered cloud or is a hosted service considered cloud from someone? I think uh, what, we, what we are going to see now is that um, more people will be using uh, cloud due to the, the lo lo um, local data centers that are, that are available now. Um, and if I just take backup as an example, uh, um, you know, why would you use a hyperscale cloud, a, a cloud provider? Well, when you talk about a dollar per terabyte uh, for long-term storage, uh, it starts to make a lot of financial sense to people. So this is it's really driven around um, what the particular business pain point is, um, as well as co uh, cost and convenience decisions. Um, uh, interesting to see how it will change over time, because as as you mentioned earlier, uh, cloud cloud usage internationally in the Flexera reports uh, looks quite different. I think over the next 12 months, we'll we'll start to see this uh, certainly shift. Um, as I mentioned, we, we feel that we are in South Africa uh, and Africa as a whole, um, 12 to 18 months behind the curve. So we can see where, it, where it's heading. And that is also indicated in this next uh, slide, which looks at what does the organization see as the biggest benefits of cloud service? And if you look at the, the top three, data backup, disaster recovery, and cost savings, those are really the what we would call um, beginner stage of uh, of cloud adoption what companies are looking for they're looking for okay well how do i back up my stuff and, and really just get it um, off disaster recovery i'm sure many many companies out there are wishing that they had um, done more of that um, during this COVID time um, we've got many customers who were planning cloud migrations but didn't put it down as their priority and then suddenly when all the companies had to go and work from home they found out that they couldn't access their systems and uh, they should have done that migration um, way in advance and I think once we start seeing the relaxation of the lockdown period we will see companies really start moving to make sure that they have moved everything into the cloud and I'll show you some of that statistics in a moment as well. Um, right down at the bottom over there in South Africa is competitive edge, only 20.28%, uh, um, sitting there saying, sorry, 27%, saying that they want, um, or they're utilizing cloud for the competitive edge. And this really speaks to the level of maturity of our cloud market, because this is such a key thing. When you look at things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, those IoT examples, those ones that I went through, where those are the, the top things that companies were utilizing cloud for. Those are the elements that give companies competitive edge in the market, that create disruption in the market. And I think over the next 12 months, South African companies will start to uh, get this and start to understand that they should be looking to really utilize cloud as much as possible for competitive advantage. So what is uh, COVID-19 um, COVID going to mean for uh, cloud usage once uh, lockdown um, has moved on? So I've gone back to the Flexera um, State of the Cloud 2020 report over here they were able to um, ask their latter respondents uh, because these results came out about two weeks ago. Um, and they were asking them, there were 187 people that they asked, how has it changed your view? 
And what you can see over there is 57% of the total respondents said that their cloud uh, expenditure and their cloud usage will be slightly higher and significantly higher than planned. So that is quite uh, dramatic. I mean, that, that is the large uh, percentage of the respondents that uh, felt that moment lockdown is finished, they are going to be going more and more into the cloud. And this really was um, further clarified and um, by, by these slides over here that I'm showing you. On the one on the left, what this is, is VPN, uh, so virtual private network um, usage surged during the COVID crisis. I mean, it's no surprise as people went to work more and more from remote locations and from home locations, you can see the change. Now, this is really early. Um, this is comparing this, the week of the 2nd of March, the week of the 9th of March, and it goes across uh, Italy, Iran, South Korea, Spain, Germany, France, and you can see um, those were the ones that locked down um, earlier and they had these peaks in utilizing cloud services over there and we would have seen the exact same um, kind of thing happening as well. What's more interesting to me is the curve or the graphs, so the bar graphs on the right hand side of this. Here they ask the question of are you nervous about leaving your home if businesses reopened and travel resumed? And these range from 78% of people saying they are nervous uh, down to 44% of them. And there's 28,000 adults in 14 countries that they surveyed over here. So what does this mean? This means that even when lockdown ends and they say you can travel and you can go back to your businesses, that a large majority of people will still be working from home and they will choose to work from home. So it really is going to be important to gear up your companies to allow, allow this. Um, Russell, any comment uh, do you want to make around these things of what we've seen during COVID? Sure. Yeah, I think well, I'd, I'd, I would love to do the survey in South Africa. I would love to know the, uh, what the results would look like. I think we'll, uh, we'll tend to be on the, on the side of, of agreeing that, um, uh, you know, we, we're not going to feel uh, uh, safe just to rush out and all gather together. Um, so um, that, but it would be interesting to see. And, and I think um, just uh, down to the basic day-to-day -day, um, activities is that uh, what have we been doing over the last few weeks? What have we do, been doing a lot of setting up VPNs um, specifically to for people to access resources inside AWS because more people mm -hmm. are working outside of uh, outside of the office, uh, or they're relying uh, more on their resources sitting in the cloud, uh, and they're moving more resources there, and and so need to um, you know, set up more secure ways of accessing them. Um, many companies, of course, still at the at the beginning phase of their cloud adoption uh, there as well. So um, yeah, I th uh, this uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So uh, that brings us to the end of our um, sli slides uh, from a data perspective. And uh, you're probably wondering, okay, well, now what? What should I be doing? I've seen the data. I've seen um, where we are from a South African perspective. We are behind the curve. We need to uh, utilize more cloud. Um, but you need to assess where you are in your cloud journey and think of it in terms of those three uh, layers, um, or three levels rather. Are you a beginner? Are you intermediate? Are you advanced? And try and see are those those challenges that you are uh, you are experiencing get in touch with a cloud managed service provider like cascade and uh, and see if you can speed up your journey to the cloud so that you can really move on to that second thing over there where it says do you want to maximize your competitive advantage uh, in the market which is what you should be doing so the sooner you move to the cloud the sooner you can actually get on the maturity curve of getting to utilize cloud as your competitive advantage uh, i've seen some wonderful examples of people you being so innovative during this time uh, here i'm thinking about state agencies uh, that have come to us and said, well, I want to, um, to start doing uh, virtual show houses. So people can't go through and, and look at houses uh, during this time. A lot of people don't want people traipsing through their house, uh, bringing in their germs, <laughs> spreading them around their house. So uh, what they're doing is they, they're creating these virtual show days um, where they film the house they have one person that just walked through they've recorded it so people can go on these virtual show days uh, another one has been a, a, a artists that have gone um, to create online 
um, viewings where people watch them creating their artwork so they're part of the process and they can then purchase the art immediately afterwards uh, another one great south african comedian alan comity had a um a show on saturday night where uh, he went into a studio, he did his comedy show, he was selling tickets of uh, 60 Rand per device that you wanted to watch on. Um, quite interesting that they've moved away now from uh, per person, obviously viewing to per device. <laughs> and uh, and he did a show. Unfortunately, he had some technical difficulties and uh, it wasn't working for streaming live, but uh, again, important on, on how you choose your service providers and making sure that everything's working beforehand. Um, but what a great idea. I'm sure that he could get far more people um, paying 60 Rand to watch his show uh, than he could uh, fill in an auditorium or in one of the theaters. So really great idea. And that will probably stick around as well. Also evaluate your business processes. So there's so much that can be done utilizing cloud involving your business processes. And I'm thinking here of serverless processes. Um, it's one of uh, Russell's really passionate areas about how do you do stuff without doing it? Uh, Russ, you want to cover that? <laughs> Certainly, it, it makes me sound like a lazy person, doesn't it? It's, it's uh, <laughs> how can I how can I do something without doing it? Uh, uh, but most certainly, um, uh, I was thinking whilst you were talking a little bit about uh, some of the use cases in, in cloud, is that the things that we, we we're really not thinking about uh, are the things that people are are currently look, using cloud for. So doing things like backup and DR and and all those kinds of things. When you when we look at them, uh, I certainly look at those things and think these are just almost templated processes, right? So uh, you, know, you can infrastructure as code to roll that kind of stuff, or you can have some very straightforward um, uh, you know, methods to, to to implement these things. Um, and, and so undoubtedly, uh, between containerization and, and serverless and autom automation, there are much better ways of, of doing things. Um, and as you say, it's uh, it's something that might be due to my uh, personality of, of not wanting to do things repetitively, but we really shouldn't be spending our money in IT on keeping those lights on. Uh, that, that should be the, the small costs. And as you mentioned in the previous slide, where should you be focusing your budget? Uh, it should be around innovation. It should be around competitive edge. It should be around uh, adding value to the business, especially in tough times. And we've seen many of them. We've seen many small companies uh, not not all enterprises, uh, it's not only enterprises that can innovate, it's one of the joys of cloud really, uh, as small companies can innovate. Um, sometimes that creates disruption, sometimes it just makes for a great business. So uh, very important points and also about uh, that will ensure your business agility. Um, you need to remain agile in order to survive and cloud gives you that ability to do that. One thing we know for, for sure is the neck in the next if you take 20 to 30 years, we are going to be going through great changes. Um, and this is not going to be the only first um, disruption that we've had in the market or disruption that we've had in our businesses. You need to remain agile. You need to be able to respond to whatever is uh, thrown your way. So uh, that brings us to the end of our uh, presentation. I just want to uh, put up on the screen over here um, some of Cascade's uh, services that are there. So we have enterprise, small, medium business offerings and startup offerings. Uh, we're really about providing you with always on IT, 99.99% pay as you use infrastructure. But we're about helping you obtain that competitive advantage. Um, and here we speak about our advanced technologies uh, consulting around the area of machine learning, AI, IoT, blockchain technology, chat to us. We, we love a, ch a challenge. Uh, one of the things that excites me um, the most is when a company comes to us and says, um, help us you know, visualize the digitization of our business. Uh, we have no clue. Uh, we don't know what we want to do. And that's really such a wonderful creative process to go through with a company. So we'd be really happy to um, assist you with that. If you are currently using cloud, chat to us about helping you reduce your costs as well. There are all our details. Um, if you want to mail us uh, any questions or anything, you can ask questions now by all means, uh, but you can mail us anytime at info at cascade.cloud. Uh, do follow us on LinkedIn, on Twitter, Facebook, you name it, Instagram, we're, we're, we're out there. Um, Russell, any parting comments from your side while I see if there are any questions? Um, absolutely. I think I would just really like to, to hear from people. Um, as you've mentioned, our passion is um, getting people some sort of competitive edge uh, or producing solutions that uh, within their businesses 
um, that uh, make a make a real difference. And and I think um, certainly, if I look at our focus as a company, we're really enjoying seeing mid market companies uh, in particular um, because they they um, uh, you know the 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 type of innovation that cloud brings them can make such a big difference in their in their business uh, rather than just adding incrementally for it uh, and and like you say there's uh, you don't know what you can do until you investigate uh, and there are numerous really great solutions out there I almost said the word tremendous um, which would make me sound like a, a certain a certain uh, country's uh, president um, but they are they're tremendous uh, and you can you can um, you can implement them uh, uh, like we said earlier but the things that you can fail fast at you know if you've got this idea you want to try something you check it out um, you don't have to commit the next 10 years or five years worth of, of uh, budget to uh, depreciating expensive assets and explain it to your accounts you can go for it that's often how cloud usage starts anyway yeah okay great um, so it seems like there are no uh, further questions or no questions that have come through um, so with that we're going to uh, end the uh, the webinar thank you for joining us today please do uh, stay in touch with us stay in contact with us and again our email address info at cascade k-a-s-k-a-d-e dot cloud thank you for joining us today bye bye bye